All right. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers, Barbara, Chuck, and Terry, for um, putting this on and inviting me to share this uh, little story. Uh, and all of you for sticking out, being here on the last afternoon of a four-day workshop after lunch, diehards. So um, I study uh, metabolism and bipolar illness or psychiatric illness. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit different and really just a case study to talk about uh, one of the applications. I've ran three data sets through the MMOC uh, metabolomics core, the first being a targeted lipomic data set looking at total free fatty acids, the second an untargeted data set where I got a few thousand small molecules, um, probably about 350 unique known molecules out of that. And the third, which I'm not going to talk about, I got more recently is the, the uh, full lipomics data set where I got about 800 plus lipids over 17 classes, I think. So um, bipolar disorder, uh, I'm not going to go into heavily, you're not psychiatrists and not really interested in this, but it's, it's more prevalent than people think. About 2 to 3% of the population, about 30% of these people end up attempting suicide at some point in their life. So it's a significant advantage, very costly for individuals with bipolar disorder. A single manic episode averages about $12,000. People get delusions of grandeur. They go out and buy a Corvette, and you know they're in debt. Um, chronic untreated illness can run up to 600, or average $625,000 over the course of a, a lifetime with somebody with un unresponsive illness. Um, but more importantly for this uh, symposium, about 50% of individuals with bipolar develop metabolic syndrome. There's a high, more, high comorbidity between diabetes, uh, disease of, diseases of insulin resistance, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. So we all have one of these. Uh, most neuroscientists, when they study the brain, really think of the brain as a neurochemical, electrochemical organ. Uh, study the brain either from the perspective of connections, uh, you know, parts of the brain talking to each other, that being disrupted in psychiatric illness, or at the, the cell level, the neuronal level, synaptic signaling, intracellular neurochemical signaling. But uh, the brain also has a massive neurovascular system. And, you know, from the perspective of this workshop, I think if you think of this system underlying the health of the brain, this is the system that delivers oxygen, delivers nutrients, removes waste, keeps everything running smoothly. And if this system is unhealthy, then uh, a lot of things can go wrong and break down with, the, with the, uh, the business end of the brain. And it's pretty easy to see why there would be a comorbidity between uh, you know, cardiovascular illness and obesity and, and, and this system, which can affect brain function. Even though the brain only weighs about 2% of your body, it's really an energy hog, uses about 15% of your cardiac output when you're resting, uh, about 20% of the oxygen you breathe, and 25% of glucose is utilized by, by the brain in a, in a resting body, not in a marathon runner, obviously, who's using that to drive muscle function, but in the resting body, it really uses a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of uh, resources. Uh, brain's also in constant two-way communication with adipose tissue, with energy stores, with the immune system, with the cardiovascular tone. So the health of the body affects the health of the brain and vice versa, and it's really difficult to distinguish between metabolic illness and psychiatric illness. Even though there are clinical distinctions, there's really a tight link between the two. Um, so there have been studies over the last few years, that, or the last decade or so, that have really begun to implicate diet in mental health. So here's one that uh, was uh, an analysis of a, a very large, a fairly large cohort, several thousand people, followed them to look at dietary patterns and found that people with a, a processed food diet had a much higher risk of developing depression five years later than those who ate a whole food diet after controlling for all of these uh, covariates like socioeconomic status, employment grade, um, diabetes, physical activity, smoking, antidepressant use, things like that. So there really seems to be this, this uh, effect of healthy lifestyle on mood disorders as well as metabolic disorders. Another paper had a semi-provocative title, at least in the psychiatric world, Should Depressive Syndromes 
be reclassified as metabolic syndrome type 2, pointing out that there are a lot of commonalities between mood disorders and those disorders of altered insulin sensitivity, including insulin signaling itself, inflammation. Inflammation is raising its head in just about every aspect of medicine, including psychiatry. Um, reactive oxygen species, glucocorticoids are dysregulated in, in depression and bipolar um, as well. So again, more, uh, uh, more evidence pointing to this commonality between diseases of the mind and the body. So I've focused on specifically on polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism in bipolar and depression. And the reason is there's a, a mounting amount of evidence suggesting an involvement of, of polyunsaturated fatty acids. I know Chuck spent a, a day talking about his own data on that. Uh, one, epidemiological studies show that societies that eat more omega-3s, mostly in the form of uh, seafood, have lower incidence of both depression and bipolar illness. Um, that's, you know, it's epidemiological, it's observational, you can't say it's causative, uh, but if you then uh, look at other types of studies, they do point towards more causation. Um, there are tissue concentrations of polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically of omega-3s, are lower in, subject, in people that attempt suicide. In animal studies, if you deplete their diets of omega-3s, you actually alter uh, specifically the neurochemistry around dopamine and serotonin, which we know uh, have, a, have a, um, a big role in controlling mood and psychi um, psychiatric illness. Um, enzymes that regulate these have lower expression in the frontal cortex of bipolar and also schizophrenics. And uh, interestingly, psychoactive medications that are commonly used to treat bipolar and schizophrenia, um, or more bipolar, the, the mood stabilizer class, actually inhibit arachidonic acid turnover, which is a major uh, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid with important functions in the brain and other parts of the body, including a, a precursor to endocannabinoid synthesis. Um, however, with all of this, giving people omega-3s to try to treat their mood has been very equivocal. Sometimes it works for some, sometimes it doesn't. So it's not as simple as just an omega-3 deficiency that you can fix with supplementation and, and make people mentally healthy. It, it's not that simple. Um, just to go over these polyunsaturated fatty acid pathways to get everybody on the same page. so. There are two essential fatty acids, one on the omega-6 side, linoleic acid up top, and one on the omega-3 side, alpha-linolenic acid. And from those two that we have to get from our diet because we can't synthesize those de novo, we can make everything else. Although the enzymes involved in the production of some of these are not that efficient in humans, so uh, some claim that uh, DHA and EPA, which come from marine sources, from fish, are semi-essential um, because we really don't make them very well. If you just supplement ALA, you really don't drive these up very well. Uh, but the point of this slide is that, that these two fatty acids, these essential fatty acids, really underlie a lot of physiological and biological systems. So down the omega-6 side, you can get a direct lipoxygen, uh, lipoxygenase product, these oxidative linoleic acid metabolites, which have PPR gamma agonist activity, a lot of roles in endothelial function. If you um, desaturate and elongate further to dihomo gamma linoleic, and then uh, cyclooxygenase products of these form anti-inflammatory cosinoids, the, the uh, series one prostaglandins, uh, further desaturation to arachidonic acid, you get um, cyclooxygenase products of pro-inflammatory uh, cosinoids. So, I mean, there's a complexity here just if you shunt here, you lead to an anti-inflammatory cyst signal, and if you shunt to here, you lead to an inflammatory signal. And then arachidonic acid is also a precursor to endocannabinoids, which we know regulate both mood and energy intake and energy systems. So a lot's going on from, from this one um, molecule, which actually in the Western diet, this one molecule is about 8% of our total caloric intake. So we eat a lot of this, uh, very high in soybean oil. On the omega-3 side, um, you know, we drive down uh, EPA, also through cyclo cyclooxygenase, you get the uh, series 3 prostaglandins um, or the resolvins and uh, down through DHA, another series of resolvins. So there's, there's a lot of physiological systems being touched by these two uh, essential dietary fatty acids. 
Um, they've changed pretty significantly over time. So if you look back to the early 1900s in the, in the Western culture, uh, a little less than 3% of our energy intake was linoleic acid, and now it's up around 7.5, closer to 8%. Uh, that's largely due to about a thousand-fold increase in the availability of soybean oil in our, in our food economy. That's primarily where it comes from. ALA, the omega-3 side, has also increased, but not as dramatically. So uh, the ratios have significantly changed, and there's a current controversy whether or not that's important, whether it's total intake of N6s and N3s that are uh, having a physiological effect or whether it's really the ratio, probably both, but it's not really clear at this point because they do compete with each other. As you saw on the last slide, they, they're processed in parallel by the same enzymes. So there's a lot of competition going on between these, these um, pathways. We know that replacing saturated fatty acids with um, polyunsaturated fatty acids is heart healthy. Um, and this has primarily been done with the replacement of saturated fats with linoleic acid, uh, but others as well. Uh, but recent questions have been raised to whether or not this is actually true because of linoleic acid's potential to be inflammatory, go down the arachidonic acid cascade and lead to inflama uh, increased inflammatory systems, too much may not be good. So again, that's controversial and the jury's still out on, on that one. Um, as I said, some suggest that the LA can lead to inflammatory and increased uh, cardiovascular risk, while others actually point to evidence that the more linoleic acid we eat, the lower our risk. So there's, there's actually a couple of major players in the field right now that are arguing, and we'll see how that, uh, we'll see how that falls out. <clears throat> so um, getting back to the bipolar study a little bit, uh, this is Hein C. Prechter. He was, uh, we have a study here called the Prechter Longitudinal Study. Hein C. Prechter, he's standing here in a sunroof because he uh, actually was the first one to introduce the sunroof to the American auto industry. So that's how he made his uh, fame and fortune. Unfortunately, Heinz suffered from bipolar illness and took his own life in 2001. His wife, Wally Prechter, then set up a philanthropic fund uh, to fund research to study this disorder, which uh, became the Heinz C. Prechter Longitudinal Study of Bipolar. It's housed here at the University of Michigan. We have about a thousand over a thousand participants now, cases and controls. They come in, they get a baseline, bi-monthly uh, baseline screening, and, and then supply us with bi-monthly data in the form of questionnaires. They come in annually for deeper evaluations. On all of these subjects, we collect neurocognitive data. We collect um, blood samples and isolate DNA and run those on Illumina chips. So we have SNP genotype, about uh, 250,000 SNPs on everybody, annual physical exams. And then I've used um, a subset of these subjects for some dietary studies. So an initial study that I did, which is actually funded by a pilot grant here at MMOC um, to run some basic metabolomics and targeted lipomics, and was able to look at uh, blood levels of lipids in the bipolar subjects and found an association between linoleic acid and DGLA and these psychiatric scores. So GAF is Global Assessment of Function. That's essentially how well people are functioning, so at work and at home sustaining their jobs, getting to work, not having functional issues, the higher the score, the better. Uh, neuroticism uh, is, is higher in bipolars and controls and is, uh, you know, could be seen as a negative personality trait. This is a depression scale and this is a mania scale. So more linoleic acid associated with better clinical outcomes, better function, lower depression, lower mania, uh, lower neuroticism. Whereas DGLA, which is a product of linoleic acid, actually had the opposite pattern. Uh, this is somewhat perplexing on why this would be the case, but it's not the only example in the literature. Others have found these opposing associations between linoleic acid and DGLA and other clinical outcomes. And then uh, the omega-3 side, ALA, actually had a, a negative association with neuroticism as well. So some some strong associations between these lipid levels and some important clinical phenotypes in the bipolars. We also looked at their associations of the same lipids with uh, physical health uh, measures of meta uh, indicators of metabolic syndrome, so waist circumference, blood pressure, fasting glucose, HDL, and triglycerides, and really the same players pop out. So linoleic acid again, 
more linoleic acid associated with better clinical scores, physical health, uh, whereas DGLA had the opposite pattern, and again, alpha linoleic acid, the other one, significant, but not nearly as broad of a pattern. So this initial study that was um, funded with the pilot grant showed associations between linoleic acid primarily and both mental health and physical health, and used this data to actually um, successfully get a KL1 to look into this stuff a little bit further. So I wanted to really explore the, what they were eating as well as a broader metabolomics, not just uh, a few lipids in the blood. So from the Prechter study, was able to recruit about 166, well, exactly 166 of them, um, prospectively track their diet for seven days. So we gave, it, gave them a diet journal, asked them to write down everything they ate and drank for seven days. It was run through the MCRU here. They came back, they returned the diet record, which we curated in the presence of a nutritionist, donated a fasted blood sample, got their current medications. This was in cases and controls. And then uh, extracted dietary data, ran untargeted metabolomics, as well as uh, the lipomics again, and, and uh, did some fancy stats. We haven't looked at the, the SNP data yet, so I'm starting to look at that and haven't incorporated these into the process. Um, yet, yeah. what we found, well first, this was, a, this was what the cohort looked like. So higher females in the bipolar group than in the control group. The age was about the same. BMI was much higher, significantly higher in bipolars. That's expected. Then in the controls, obviously the bipolars are on medications that the controls are not, are not on. The bipolars ate, so of the 154 nutrients that are extracted from the journal, these are the seven that met statistical significance after multiple testing correction. Because if you're looking at 154, we've got to do some multiple testing correction. So of the seven that met significance, significantly different intake, six of them are fats, four of them are polyunsaturated fatty acids. All right, so pretty high representation of polyunsaturated fatty acids in, in what bipolars are eating differently than controls. Less selenium more of a couple of saturated fats and less of all of these polyunsaturated fats, arachidonic acid, tocosapentanoic, kicosapentanoic, and DHA. All right, and then the healthy eating index score was actually significantly lower in bipolars um, as well. So then running metabolomics on the fasted blood samples and overlaying the results onto this pathway that I showed you earlier, we find in yellow, this is what I just showed you on the previous slide, they eat less of these, but they have lower plasma levels of everything in blue. So they don't eat less linoleic acid, but their plasma levels are significantly lower, suggesting a metabolic difference in the bipolars relative to the controls. I did correct for medication use, and this survived, so uh, at least as well as I could correct for medication use, that's not an easy thing to do. And these Patients are on polypharmacy. I mean, they, they take a lot of different drugs, and it's very difficult to optimally correct for that. But um, correcting for it as best I could, these, these findings still survived. And then this one, DGLA, again, had higher plasma levels than bipolars. So if you remember, linoleic acid associated uh, in the initial study with better mental health and better physical health, and the blood levels are lower. Whoops. The blood levels are lower in bipolar whereas DGLA associated with worse physical health and worse mental health and the blood levels are higher in bipolar. So is it secondary? Is it causative? I don't know. Um, but, it's, but it's interesting that the, the data is uh, holding up in the metabolomics. Um, finally, I actually looked then at an association between the plasma levels of the polyunsaturated fatty acids and the self-report questionnaires that we get back every couple of months. So there are three that I looked at. I looked at life functioning questionnaire, which again is a measure of functionality. PHQ-9 is a measure of uh, depression. SF-12 is a, is a mental health component, uh, mental health composite score from a, from a health questionnaire. And bipolars obviously have lower or worse scores. The SF-12 is actually inversely scored, so a higher score is, is worse. I mean, the other way around, a higher score is better whereas the others are not. So bipolars obviously have worse clinical scores on these. The question in this model using a mediation 
model was to see if plasma linoleic acid mediated the effect of bipolar illness on these scores. And it did significantly on, in all three of these. So even within bipolars, those that had higher levels of plasma linoleic acid had better clinical outcomes. All right. DGLA was only significant for the SF12. Um, the, direction was, the direction was opposite of linoleic acid, but this was the only one that was significant. And interestingly, EPA and omega-3 that you get from fish oil that has a lot of data you know, suggesting it's healthy uh, and has been used to try to treat depression, um, there was no association between EPA plasma levels and these mental health outcomes in bipolars. It seemed to be the omega-6 side that was um, having a bigger effect. So just another interesting thing, if I correlate, uh, just a correlate plasma levels, which one's pl plasma levels of these fatty acids with dietary intake, you get a nice correlation with linoleic acid an inverse correlation with DGLA. So the more linoleic acid people eat, the higher the level in the blood expected, but it drives down DGLA, which is a product of linoleic acid. So there's probably some feedback inhibition on the enzyme there. Um, and this is the interesting piece because this is different in bipolars and controls. So this is in controls, the more EPA and DHA omega-3s they eat, the more show up in the blood. That association is gone in bipolars. So there seems to be no association between dietary intake and blood levels of these long chain omega-3s in bipolars, whereas there is a, a strong association in controls. And you expect an association. I mean, the studies, all that have been done, show that you eat more, more shows up in the blood, but they haven't been done in a psychiatric population. Maybe the drugs inhibit this. Um, we think the drugs hit these pathways. Maybe there's something else going on in eight to the metabolism of, of these psychiatric patients. Um, so in summary, uh, plasma LA associates with better mental and physical health. Dietary LA intake inversely associates with DGLA, which is uh, not, we don't really know why yet, and that's, there's not a lot of literature about that. Um, linoleic acid and its metabolites seem to be altered in bipolar disorder, independent of dietary intake. The omega-3s EPA and DHA don't seem to associate dietary intake, doesn't seem to associate with plasma levels in bipolars for whatever reason. And taken together, the PUFA metabolism just appears to be dysregulated uh, in bipolars. So this data um, really came from a, a, a KO1 and has now been used to apply for an R01. So just to show you, that really is just an example of a path of using MMOC services to generate data to apply for um, larger and larger grants, and, and it's been, a, I think, a very uh, interesting uh, study so far. I think that is it. I have uh, some acknowledgments both on the bipolar research group side, a lot of people involved in that. Um, funding came, as I said, from the research fund as well as my own KO1 uh, funding to Dr. McGinnis, who runs the bipolar research group, and uh, Dr. Burian's studies who support the MMOC. So that's it. Are there any questions? So, um, when you're looking at, these, you're looking at the fat, fatty acids here, this did in plasma. Yes. And so, this is targeted and across like all the phospholipids, et cetera. Like it's the total lipids from the plasma. This was a yeah total free fatty acid analysis that I talked about here. Okay. We have run now a. Uh, um, the, what do you get? So I, I can't use the word shotgun lipomics. What am I supposed to say? You can use it. Shotgun lipidomics. We've run that, but I haven't, I haven't looked at that, where we, where we will be able to distinguish between the phospholipid classes. Okay. Yeah. Did you see any effect of medications in patient populations? So I corrected for medications, and the, the um, findings survived. But if you just look at the effect of medications, they... Medications do influence the level of DGLA. The, the antipsychotics influence the level of DGLA. So they do seem to be hitting this pathway uh, at some level. But, they, but do medication use doesn't explain the results. 
Do you think okay. that is affecting eating behavior of patient or some peripheral action of that medicine? I mean, people do eat more on some of the antipsychotics. Uh, some of them cause, can cause 20 pounds weight gain in you know, four to six weeks when they first, when they first go on these things. So there is, there is an effect, and, and part of that is hunger and eating more. Kyle's probably the expert on this, actually. <laughs>